Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. That's the type of thing that where I, I think people will say, wow, it really is like the movies. It really is as bad as you know we thought it was going to be. But at the same time, everything always gets adjusted to, right? Either we'll start to think that's normal or we'll make adjustments to to ensure it doesn't keep happening. So I don't think there's going to be any sort of you know, genie out of the bottle that we can't fix, uh, but it but it could definitely be bumpy uh, in the next few years. It's difficult enough to manage network security, or web security, or application security, or mobile security. But when they all come together, you have this Frankenstein-like monster called IoT security, and then you have the unique challenges of security, system security too. Welcome to IoT. In this episode of the IoT Business Show, I speak with Daniel Measler about the top security risks facing IoT and how to mitigate them. This is part one of a two-part interview. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on episode 29 is Daniel Measler. This is part one of a two-part podcast series. Daniel is Principal Architect with HP Fortify and has over 15 years of information security experience across the network, web, mobile, and IoT spaces. In the last 10 years, his specialty has been in penetration testing. His current focus is on standardizing security testing for IoT, and he is the creator and leader of the OWASP IoT project. Daniel was also the author of a recent HP study on IoT security, so I thought he'd be a great guest for the show. Daniel, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. So tell me about this concept called universal daemonization. Yeah, so this is um, an idea I came up with uh, two or three years ago. Uh, basically, the idea is that you know things connecting to things is mm-hmm. not necessarily... Um, the pinnacle of IoT, and, right. and that uh, it's actually going to end up being much more of a human concept. So the idea is interesting. Yeah, so that basically giving every object, uh, which are humans, businesses, cars, furniture, uh, a bidirectional digital interface that mm-hmm. serves as a representation of itself. Right. So the these interfaces would broadcast information about the object and basically provide interaction points for others. So you can imagine this being built on a stack like HTTP and REST and obviously TCP IP. But the Mm -hmm. idea is to have two-way interaction, uh, basically an API for every object, based on complete standardization um, on a technology stack that we already have. Hmm. So the communication protocol would be what between between the objects? So it would be HTTP and, and REST. And, oh, okay. Yeah, just, so yeah. just utilizing that. So it's really just a data construct you're saying, or just a common data construct that would allow easy communication or easy, I guess, interfacing between objects. Absolutely. Hmm. hmm. So when do you see uh, when do you see this, something like this happening? Well, I mean, what part of the evolution? Um, I think it will be a little bit longer. I, I think, as we'll probably talk about, I, there are a lot of things that need to happen before then. Um. Mm. As you know, the the protocols still need to come to some sort of agreement. I think we're still in the beta versus VHS phase uh, for for a lot of the different protocols. Mm -hmm. You mean which type of protocols do you mean? 
well, just all the all the various protocols that are being used at the various layers of IoT. I don't okay. I don't think there's any sort of standardization on anything, let alone HTTP right now. Yeah, maybe the only standardization is on the network protocol, that being IP. I'm hoping anyway, trying to get that past the IT and into the OT networks. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, interesting. So maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll chat a little bit more about this in the future. But why don't you give our listeners a bit of a background about yourself? In IoT, yeah. So I'm, like you said, I'm currently a principal architect with HP Fortify, which is mm -hmm. um, basically HP's application security division. I uh, spent the last six years standing up a security practice called uh, Fortify in Demand, which is our uh, cloud-based application security provider. Um, okay. And basically, there I, I built the uh, various methodologies, um, or I led the building of uh, various methodologies. Um, around testing uh, web, mobile, you know, thick client, and of course IoT, uh, which is a practice we just recently stood up. Um, and I also had the research on um, looking at various IoT devices. We've done three separate studies: uh, one on ten assorted devices, mm -hmm. uh, one on home security cameras and one, the most recent one, on smartwatches. So I'm also leading that research. What was the first one again? I was 10 assorted devices. So it was like sprinklers, thermostats, scales, different, basically the top devices that were being sold at the time, we took the top 10 and tested those. So would I be right to guess that your second, your second report was the scariest, the one with the home, uh, the home network cameras? I would say so just because of you know, the same reason you're thinking of. Um, and yes, all, all the worst things you're imagining were possible. Um, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I've spoken to others in the past and particularly with network cameras. I don't know, maybe just because they were there already and it seemed like a natural fit and they can get into it pretty quickly, but the security, you know, in particular passwords and, and entire group passwords or, or, using serial numbers or whatever the case, it seemed like they maybe jumped into it a little, a little before the security side was baked in. And, uh, that's, that's at least what I've, you know, what I've been led to understand. No, that's exactly right. Um, I mean, it's, uh, unfortunately what we're facing is uh, that all the problems from network security, application security, web security, mobile security, mm. we haven't really solved any of those yet. We're still no. struggling with those. And what we've done with IoT is take and build like a Frankenstein out of all of them. Yeah. You have a network right, component. Right. You have a mobile component. You have a cloud security component. You have web security. You have all these. And they're all jammed together into one sort of uh, process or, or product. And that, that's what does it. Yeah, no, actually, I didn't really think about it that way before. But you're kind of tripling... Wow, you know, your your so called attack surfaces in a way, aren't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, and also, you know, the discussions I've had with with uh, experts in the past have really centered around uh, at least one theme has kind of been the wild wild west out there in the sense of there's not a lot of standardization for security or for testing, and and I'm really interested if you can maybe give us a, a bit of an overview on the OWASP uh, IoT project. Yeah, absolutely. So the OWASP IoT project is a project that started around two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And basically, its purpose is to understand the various contexts of who needs IoT help. So developers, uh, manufacturers, testers um, are the main ones. And basically for, say, a manufacturer, when they're trying to do the right thing, um, mm -hmm. but they don't have maybe a team of in-house experts in security, you know, what can we tell them um, to, to work on first or to make sure you at least avoid these top five issues? So, uh, so what we've done is we've broken down, we have a number of sub-projects in the overall IoT uh, project, but one of them is the Attack Surface Area project, mm -hmm. which basically is a, an attempt at a universal approach to looking at the security of an IoT system, whether that's a toothbrush or an airplane or a giant ICS network. Interesting. Um, the idea is, you know, what are the surfaces that you definitely need to check no matter what? Um, 
with my background in penetration testing, I mean, that's kind of always what you're looking for. What did I miss? What is the approach mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about? Mm -hmm. um, so right now, there's currently 16 surface areas that we have uh, defined for that, which is definitely worth taking a look at. And is that? And do they span the mobile network and application spaces? Absolutely. It's it's mobile. It's network. It's application. It's um, it's all sorts of things. It and it breaks them down pretty discreetly, so that you can be sure to cover them um, in the give them the the respect that they deserve. So, for example, we we break up how we track data mm -hmm. that is entered from a user and how it goes out to a trusted back end that belongs to the vendor, you know, does that have the proper security on it? Does that have any clear text, you know, uh, usernames or passwords or sensitive mm -hmm. data, but also mm -hmm. separately, what about the third party attack service that's going out to the internet? Right. Um, this is what we found. What do you mean the third party attack service? Yeah. So, um, one of the things we found in our research, and if you just look at sort of most IOT devices, is if you just turn it on and use it, yeah. um, you will see five up to like 15 connections going out. Um, Ooh, so I did a talk at uh, talk at uh, DEF CON uh, just this past few weeks, right. and um, right, right. it was about the Attack Surface project and actually released a small tool called uh, Caparser. And what it does is it... Um, it captures a full PCAP of everything that takes place uh, coming and going for mm -hmm. your entire IoT environment internally. And then it captures that into one PCAP, and then it does some analysis on how many hosts did that IoT system actually interact with. And, yeah, and if you go to a, a, a vendor or to some interested party and you say, hey, look, it looks like you're talking to 13 different destinations on the internet mm -hmm. um, and we broke them into their discrete uh, destinations and we also found um, the exact domain name so we could tell you if it's a malicious right. domain or something like that um, and then we look for is there clear text data in that content so what you can do is you can en enter like a honey token like uh, like wombat or something like that something that wouldn't be a normal string you would find and if you see mm -hmm. it going to any of these connections, you could be sure, one, you have an unencrypted connection, but it's being sent to a place that maybe the consumer, maybe even the vendor might not understand. It could be an ad network, an analytics network. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. I mean, you're, you're basically yeah. putting data into an ecosystem thinking it's going to one back end when, in fact, it could be sent to all sorts of third parties, may or may not using encryption. So, okay, no, I get that. And, and to me that, yeah, that, that's just kind of part of the, you know, that's part of the game, but aren't you talking more of a privacy issue than a, than a security issue? Cause I, I don't understand how just connecting to these different services are going to change the security, the privacy. Sure. The security, the, explain that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, or at least I, I see them, uh, as being quite combined, um, okay. I mean, if, if you abstract it a little bit and you say avoiding things we don't want to happen, right? Yep. Um, and that could be availability, it could be integrity, it could be confidentiality. In this case, it's confidentiality. Okay, okay. Right, and, and I think for a consumer, when they're thinking security, when they're thinking safety, these words sort of conflate into uh, security and privacy. They, they all sort of mix together. Okay. No, no. I, then I totally get you. I totally get you then. I, I mean, we're just putting a little bit finer point on it, but you, you are saying, Hey, you should be aware of, of <laughs> what you're connecting to. There's, there's a lot more than just this, this two direction, uh, you know, bi-directional communication going on. And yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's really valuable. I just want to clarify, you know, for our listeners, the security versus the privacy. And is that the right way to, I mean, that, that's the right way to break it up to, to separate it or is it, or can you even separate even more than that? Privacy, security, or is there more? I'm sure you can go farther down or you can go high, higher up. Um, the way I like to think about it um, with a testing background is mm -hmm. abuse cases. What, what are the things we're trying to avoid happening? Right. Um, 
and you can make a, a pretty simple list of them for any type of system. Um, yeah. You know, if it's a refrigerator and you're not entering privacy data, what are your abuse cases? Well, someone else takes control of the refrigerator and now they're pivoting to your internal data. They're also using the refrigerator to attack other systems using your bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's almost abuse case based where you know there's a list of things that you do not want to happen and you want to stop those from happening. And if yeah. one abuse case is your sensitive data goes out to the internet, another abuse case is you um, are part of a DDoS attack against the government. Those, in in <laughs> some sense, uh, you know, Not so collapse good. together. Yeah, they collapse together and become things we're trying to avoid. Yeah, definitely being part of a, a botnet attacking your government would be one of the things I'd probably want to avoid for sure. But yeah, no, I think this is awesome uh, because I think these are important first steps because a lot of a lot of manufacturers that I speak to, they put up their hands a little bit and they just say, well, you know, we're not even really sure what we should be doing here, you know, what we should be looking at. They may have, like you were saying, you know, they, maybe they have a bit of a mobile security background or a network security background, but often they don't have the application security background. And so I think this is a great service. And, and, and the second thing I want to say is I'm kind of surprised. What did you say there was? 14, 15, I would have thought there would have been more of the, of the, um, of the top, what did you call them? The attack surfaces? Attacks. Yeah. I would have thought that there would have been more attack surfaces than just, um, what do you say? 14, 15? Yeah. Uh, I believe it's 16 right now. And 16. Okay. Yeah. And it is an open project. I mean, it's, uh, it's open free project and it's, you know, mailing list based. So if someone mm -hmm. pings us and says, Hey, you're crazy. This needs to be 27 or you're crazy. This needs to be. 11 instead i mean we're completely open to that we we adjust as you know logic dictates we should um yeah. in general we're we're pushing for uh simplicity I, I think uh what did einstein say i really liked uh, make everything as simple as possible but no simpler right. um yeah. yeah i like that one a lot so i mean i i i wish it were five right i wish it were five surface areas but we ended up with 16, and if it turns into 27, then we'll be happy with that as well. We just want to make it as usable and practical as possible. No, and I think, um, so we're going to include a link to the the, the OWASP project uh, in the show notes, but I think a lot of our listeners will be well served to jump on there. And if it's not you, then, then pass it on to your security guy or gal, um, because I think the more minds on this, the more people you know looking at this, the better. So uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, what's something interesting that most people don't know about you, though? Um, well, I carry a table tennis paddle with me in my bag <laughs> wherever I travel. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's my sport, pretty much. And so, do you find uh, do you find many uh, places to play? Absolutely. Um, a lot of people um, have in their. Uh, rec rooms or whatever they have a have a table and they have stuff sitting around and i pull out my uh my pro gear and they start <laughs> start saying oh what's gonna happen now and then we uh, get into it <laughs> so okay so you're saying when you do personal travel not business travel i i thought you meant uh, business travel no ev everywhere uh, so, oh, everywhere. so some people okay. go to the gym after work i i yeah. find a local table tennis club and go there Love it, love it. Uh, yeah, and that reminds me of the movie Forrest Gump when he, that was just one of his achievements. So, so do you stand like, what, 10 feet from behind the, the table to, to really whack it? Uh, you can, but you're actually giving up ground if you step away from the table. And if you're playing someone good, you'll just lose. Ah, nice, nice, nice. All right, well, let's shift into IoT and, and uh, security in particular. And I'm interested just, you know, from a, a gut level point of view, what's the overall state of security in IoT? Uh, I would say, uh, pretty bad. I would say, pretty bad. I would okay. say, um, a D or an F. And what would you, what would you say the overall state of security is in networking in general? Uh, network security, Fair. um, mm -hmm. a B, B or okay, B minus so. or yeah. All right. Okay. So explain why is it, why is it so bad? Is it just where we are today and it's all the above, you know, already we've covered a couple of them just identifying what needs to be done, training, awareness. Uh, wh why are we where we are right now? 
Yeah, I, w- I would say it's just a matter of maturity. It's not any particular hit against IoT. It's just something to be completely expected. Uh, if you think about the first um, skyscraper to be built or even the first modern buildings after wood buildings, mm. you imagine going to the, those very first buildings and saying, hey, you know, what are your 17 inspection levels and have the auditors approved your work? Like, it's just not a conversation you have when you're starting off. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I hear what you're saying. And, you know, something that perturbs me is, uh, and I know this is just the nature of our media. However, it's not like one in five, but maybe it almost seems like one in 10 uh, articles on IoT are about security. And inevitably, it's not just about security, it's about the lack of security and, you know, how the world is coming to an end. Um, I know it sells, well, sells newspapers. It doesn't really sell newspapers, but it's more like, uh, clickbait now. I know it, I know it gathers, uh, clicks, but, uh, do you feel that it's overblown like I do or, or do you think that, you know, do you think that it's being accurately portrayed in the press today? Um, so I, I think it's a bit of, a bit of both, uh, depending on who the source is and, you know, what they're attempting to do with the narrative. But, I think it is it'll simultaneously be much bigger and and much more uh tolerable than people say and and here here's what I mean by that. I think when you have services like Shodan that um allow you to find sort of any device on the internet that's that's actively listening and you mm-hmm. can do these really complex queries um in the search engine, it's basically think of a search engine for IoT. It's not sure. not quite that, but it's close. Um, right. And you could say, say someone comes out with a, a car hack or a refrigerator hack or an airplane hack, and it turns out that you could just query for this exact airplane model, an exact version, and it'll respond. And suddenly, you can go from a release on Twitter of a vulnerability to an attacker finding all 94,000 of those devices in the search engine and launching live attacks. I think it will become um, kind of movie-ish in in the sort of how much impact it could have. I mean, we could see something Mm -hmm. where, you know, potentially state actors are, you know, blinking traffic lights in a city to send us a message, you know, that type of thing. Mm. Um, th- that's the type of thing that where I, I think people will say, wow, it really is like the movies. It really is as bad as, you know, we thought it was going to be. But at the mm. same time, everything always gets adjusted to, right? Either we'll start to think that's normal or we'll make adjustments to, to ensure it doesn't keep happening. So I don't think there's going to be any sort of, you know, genie out of the bottle that we can't fix. Uh, mm-hmm. but it but it could definitely be bumpy uh, in the next few years. Now, why haven't we seen any of this um to date? Well, I think we have just on a much smaller scale. Um okay. I, I think when you imagine what percentage of analog objects um in the world are actually addressable and interactable through the internet. Um I don't know what the numbers are, but it's many, many zeros. Um, it's probably around nine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So dot and like many, many zeros and then a one. So it's just such a tiny number of uh, devices that can actually be interacted with. And, and as that moves along, as cities start coming online and cars and and people see the value, especially the marketing value of having all these things online and having them be interactable which goes back to the whole universal demonization thing, that uh, surface area just magnifies exponentially. And that's when I think we'll start seeing this sort of movie type stuff. But again, at that point, it'll be a lot more normal and life will go on. I don't, I don't think it's going to be a doomsday scenario. No, nor do I. But, you know, just to, to dig into this a little bit, a little bit more, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the volume the volume is great, but you even said just a little while ago, you know, that there's only 16 attack surfaces. So I don't care how big the volume is. I mean, there's still only 16 attack surfaces, right? Yeah, that's true. But um, 
I mean, it's, it's 2015 and, uh, most of the devices we tested, well, actually mm. not most, all 10 out of 10, mm. uh, we tested home security cameras. Um, yeah. you, we were able to basically brute force the login and just log in with, uh, credentials that we discovered. So right. it would reveal to us what the credentials were. This is a problem from a, a, quite a long time ago. This is a, say, 10-year-old problem Sure, that's been solved for 10 years. Uh, basically, the complexity of doing IoT security right will lag far behind the speed with which things go online. So it's not a matter of there's only 16 surface areas. It, the question is, how good are we at securing any of those surface areas? And I think the answer right now is not very good. Yeah, no, and I think I want to clarify. Uh, the problems are definitely there. I guess what I'm saying is that with there being 16 security services, the solution's also there too in the sense that it is, you know, it's not like it's a 1,000, if you know what I mean. No, absolutely. It's, you know, 16 is addressable. You can address them. And if it's anything like network security and probably, you know, I'm not as familiar with mobile and application security less to a lesser extent, but if it's anything like network security, 99.97 of them are, are fixable if you just, you know, if you just get an update, you know, that's available on the internet or has been available on the internet for two, three years. And I think that's kind of, you know, what you're saying about the cameras, right? I mean, the cameras, it's maybe a little bit of an unfair example in the sense that the cameras were being used in a non-IoT way, in a closed way, or maybe just, you know, a, a very, maybe just a local network or or through, you know, one user. It wasn't connected in the same way. But yeah, I mean, they should have fixed their security problems. It just wasn't, it just wasn't exposed the same way as, as in an IoT environment. Um, I, I'm sure it's not just network cameras, you know, we could, we could bring up another one, but I guess, you know, I, I guess for me, you know, one of my pet peeves, and I said this before, I'm just perturbed all the time by hearing the press just, you know, going on like, you know, chicken little about security. It is, it is an addressable problem. We, yes, there are problems that are out there. And like you said, here we are, you know, we're talking to the expert, there's 16 attack surfaces, you know, so you can get your arms around 16, and I don't think it's going to, you know, we we haven't had banks, you know, losing all their money up to this point in time. They're on the Internet. You know, we haven't had, um, you know, our electric grids being taken down. They're getting more and more, you know, the smart grids are on the, elect are on, are on the Internet. So I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just me, but but it just it just sort of bothers me and, uh, when I hear, you know, the focus being on how IoT is going to fail or how it's going to blow up just because of security. I I, I you know, you tell me if I'm wrong, but it just seems to me that it is a manageable issue. It's always going to be cat and mouse, right? But so so has so has been security up to this point in time. Yeah, yeah, I I think I agree with that uh, to a large extent. Um, on on the security cameras, they actually were internet facing. Um, so okay, yeah, so okay. they're all basically um, pretty much every IoT device at this point comes out with a mobile app, and the mobile app allows yeah. you to control your home security cameras and view them and everything from the mobile app. So that's what we were able to do is connect a mobile app, you know, mm. to the cloud interface, which gives you full visibility. So you can know if the person's home, you could watch the different right. rooms. Right. All, no, that's scary. Yeah. All that sort of stuff. But I, I do agree with what you're saying. I mean, it's not so much that it won't be bad. It's just that lots of things are bad and we'll, right. we'll get through it. We'll deal with it. You know, there's lots of things that are bad now with security, but we're, we somehow seem to be inching, inching forward. Well, yeah, I want to start talking, uh, you know, again, I, I want to just give our listeners an overview of, we can start with the major findings of the study. I know there's been three of them. It seems like maybe number one, I don't know, you, you, you can actually, you can actually go over whatever the major, whichever study you want, the major or all the above. The major findings, but I want to start now getting into, you know, what should we be looking out for? And I know a lot of these are going to be just common sense, but let's let's get into it. So, what were some of the major, you know, findings of your studies? Yeah, so the the biggest one, uh, in my view, is web interfaces that are mm -hmm. internet exposed that don't do authentication and authorization well. Um, and this goes back to sort of the previous points. 
around mm. um, authentication. So pretty much, well, not every, but many, many IoT devices have a cloud or a internet-facing web interface. Yep, they do. And it's typically username and password. And there are just a, a tons of tons of literature exists around how to secure this stuff correctly. Um, but when you're talking about being a device manufacturer, it, it's actually remarkably difficult. And you, you sort of understand and feel for the groups trying to do this. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things we try to help with at HP is going to these groups and saying, you know, here's some, here's some guidance, here's some consulting on how to build security into the products, right? So that's mm -hmm. what we do on the commercial side. Because mm -hmm. it's actually remarkably difficult to have, say, one or two developers who are good at their one particular thing and say, right. Right. so here's what we need you to do. For all of the spaces, network security, mobile, web, cloud-based, all of this, just implement the best possible, you know, scenarios and hardening practices in all of those spaces before you roll out the product. <laughs> right, right. That's just really hard to ask somebody to do uh, okay. without a lot of help, right? So that's, that's why we do what we do on the HP side. That's why we have the OWASP is to sort of give guidance there. Um, and really, I think what needs to happen is the same thing that's happening now in programming languages. It's the same thing that's happening in lots of different tech spaces, which is standardization and build, sure. building security in. Uh, it really comes down to making it so that the manufacturer and the developer don't really have an insecure option. When, when they mm -hmm. say... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they follow a standard, you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. For example, you know, .NET is a good example. It, each time they release a new version of the .NET framework, they add more secure defaults, right? Where when you mm. just use the framework the way you're supposed to, security is already built in. Right. Um, because I think, you know, largely what security has found is when you're relying on someone to go and do something extra out of band of their regular work effort, mm -hmm. that's when you can largely expect failure um, across a large population. Right, right. No, I like that. It's like make them turn something off rather than make them turn something on. And so if you subscribe to a security package that has the you know, the, the, the former philosophy, then you're, you're, per, you're probably better off. Absolutely. And that's one of the things we focus on, on the IoT project is, um, mm -hmm. one of the projects underneath it, one of our first, um, projects of this type is going to be a secure update system. So we're looking to say, you know, look, we always tell you to build a secure update system. This is what a lot of people complain about security types about is, um, yeah. They ding yep. you for not having a secure update system. But when you ask them, they're like, well, there's lots of different ways to do it. Right. And that doesn't really help a developer who's trying to write a line of code. So what we're trying to do is say, here's a framework that you could potentially use to, you know, handle keys, to handle certificates, to do exchanges, to do software signatures and say, if you roll this out, or if you implement this framework, you will be relatively secure, not necessarily completely, but um, that's the type of thing we're trying to offer is a way to tangibly improve security. Yeah, no, and I think that makes sense. And, and I think you're talking generally, but to close the loop on number one, that being the web interfaces, that's the, that's, that's the recommendation is to, is to, is to use um, the right frameworks, the, the right packages, uh, choose them and then, and then not turn things off. Is that, is that the recommendation? Well, you know, I like to go through what the, you know, what the findings were and then your recommendation to our, you know, to our listeners. Oh, absolutely. So I can give you some, some key examples for the first one for web, okay. web security authentication. Uh, the biggest ones are not allowing or, um, using secure passwords. So they allow, um, the one we tested actually was one, two, three, four, five, six, which, um, uh, also run the, uh, sec list project, which is a group of, um, it's a group of the, the most popular passwords and usernames yes. and security yes. lists. Mm -hmm. So basically the top one in all of these lists, the number one password is one, two, three, four, five, six. So 
that's what we tested with for weeks uh, password policy, and um, all of them, all of them failed that. So, so simply stay, stating, you know, do not use common dictionary words. Do not allow things like one. So not even checking for it. You're saying you're saying just giving the guidance. Absolutely. Jeez, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So. Yep. So basically requiring a complex password of some sort. It doesn't have mm. to be, you know, NSA grade or anything like that, but some sort of complex password. Next one right. is account lockout. We didn't have any products that had account lockout, and that allows for brute force. So yeah, account, right. account lockout after five or seven or even nine or 20 would be nice, uh, but none of the products... Um, I don't want to say none, but none of the products we've tested so far um, had that protection. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing is there are ways of um, determining when a username that you guess is a correct one or not. And this is a, it's basically an inference attack where you, you could say um, it, it all, it's all based on the error message that you get back. So oftentimes mm-hmm. you'll enter in, you know, Bruce at domain.com mm-hmm. and it'll come back and say, Bruce is not a valid user. Right. So it's giving the information right there. Yeah. So I just say Bruce at some other domain.com and it says oh, password incorrect. So that's a valid thing. We add it to the list. And what happens wow. is when you stack these together, we can now do what's called mm-hmm. account harvesting and just, we, we just let it run for a little while and we come back mm-hmm. and we have uh, a way to log in and use the system. Yeah, especially if there isn't that lockout, right? Absolutely. Hmm. No, this is really, I mean, it, it's really its really useful what you're telling us. And it's really common sense. But that's what a lot of this boils down to, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, take us on to number two. Yeah. So um, the, the other big one, and also uh, just as obvious and uh, disturbing, is unencrypted connections. So right, right. we're seeing not only connections flying around on the LAN, whether it's Bluetooth or wireless or whatever it is, um, network connections. Uh, we're seeing all sorts of things flying around using no encryption whatsoever, using FTP, using plain text, HTTP. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that's a big issue. It's especially a big issue. Um, talking about the, the um, talk I did at DEFCON is, is – when that data leaves out and goes to the internet and it goes to these various locations, uh, what we've seen is a lot of analytics networks and um, ad networks, they don't like SSL because it's expensive for them. Mm-hmm. So when um, a legitimate copy of your private application data is sent to the legitimate back end, of course that's SSL and it's got proper certs and everything. Yep. But oftentimes if that framework for that application includes analytics, that analytics library will just take a, a clear text copy of everything you entered because maybe the ad uh, network wants to know about that or the analytics network wants to know about that. And it'll send it to them without encryption. Because why? On their end, they it, it's just too complicated to unencrypt it? No, it's, it's a performance hit because their mm-hmm. game is to mm-hmm. receive tens of thousands of connections a minute or Got whatever. It. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. Now explain this, Daniel, uh, notwithstanding, you know, like a DDoS attack or, or other malicious attacks that are just meant to cause mayhem. If your data is encrypted with today's standard of encryption, notwithstanding maybe certain, certain state bodies or state actors, but if it is encrypted, even if people catch your data, it's safe in the sense that sure they got my data, but they can't unencrypt it. Or, or, or am I missing something? I mean, it seems to me that number one is encrypt everything because even if they get in, you know, again, other than creating havoc, at least if you're worried about the data from a data privacy, I guess is maybe a better way to frame this. From a data privacy point of view, if you encrypt it, it doesn't matter, does it? Or, or is there more? Or is there more nu- more nuances to that? Um. In a large sense, what you're saying is true. The, the issue with encryption is never, you know, someone went and broke AES-256 and, and they got the data. That, that's never the attack, really. What the mm-hmm. attack is, is did you get the data before it got encrypted? Did the encryption scheme make a mistake in how it encrypted it? So one of the common 
things we see it in our pen testing side, uh, for example, on mobile apps, is they will mm-hmm. use AES two fifty six, which is you know a gold standard. Yep. And they'll leave the keys in the same directory. Got it. Got right. It. Okay. So it's the way you're encrypting it, not okay. That that's the issue you're saying. Well, absolutely. I mean, when we look at testing the security of an IoT system, we're looking at where are keys stored, how are they managed, how are they, you know, deprecated, reissued. Uh, what is the process of going from unencrypted to being encrypted? Um, yes. And what happens to the data when it lands? That's the other side of this equation is now it went out to the cloud. Where did it land? Can I attack that? So you're kind of looking at all angles. And the the two endpoints of, you know, between which everything was encrypted, mm-hmm. assuming it was a good algorithm, you're absolutely mm-hmm. protected. But the odds are very good that there's weakness on either side. So what you're saying then is something like what, like a man in the middle type of attack where between when the data is unencrypted and encrypted. So man in the middle is definitely another option uh, when authentication is not used. And that, that actually is a a big issue in IOT, Um, Mm -hmm. especially with a lot of the lower power um, devices. Um, By the way, listen to a whole bunch of your previous episodes, really excellent stuff. Um, talking about basically the stack and coming from the sensor up. I really like the approach, but when you take some of those sensors that basically cannot, um, cannot maybe do SSL or cannot maybe do Mm. full certificates, uh, what they'll often do is do some sort of symmetric key exchange, right? Where that could be a good algorithm, but just as with Diffie Hellman and a couple of these other algorithms, um, you can actually have someone in the middle who's exchanging with both sides and each side would not know that there's someone in the middle. Right, right, right. Okay. So getting back to the unencrypted connections, what you're saying is if you encrypt it correctly, <laughs> if it's cre- encrypted correctly or it's, or it's implemented properly and you don't, and you're not lazy or, or, you know, yeah, I guess lazy and put the keys in, in places where people can find them. If it's encrypted, it's the the integrity of the data is going to be safe, right? Yeah, and hopefully confidentiality as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. And that's what it comes down to, right? We have these categories for, you know, encrypted connections, and that, that has a couple of different modules, right? Use the proper algorithms. You know, if mm. you're using certificates, make sure they're, you know, handled properly. If, you, um, if you're generating keys, how are you managing them? Uh, so there are all these subcomponents of make sure you're doing these things well, and then your encryption will back you up. But if you fail at those things, you're really just um, encrypting one little hop where Mm. all your attack surface is on some Mm -hmm. other part of the application. No, that, that, that does make sense. And I was going to ask you though, however, I mean, you know, the, there in IOT, we still have the, and this is a source of security issue, but, you know, we have the IT OT network divide, you know, and there's going to be a seam often between the OT. That OT network can be in a factory or it can be really, really small, you know, maybe even in a watch or a washing machine. But there is still going to be that there is going to be that proprietary um, network technology where they're communicating with the sensors. And that's what I want. That's what that's what I want to just touch on, because you brought it up, I think, a very good point. And I'm looking for your advice on sensor networks because the sensor networks are often until we push IP all the way to the sensor, and which I believe we should. And one of the big reasons is security. So we have an end-to-end, you know, secure line. But until we do that, what can you do? I mean, because perhaps even the OT network isn't even going to have the option to <laughs> to use encryption, or or can you encrypt pretty? Well, I don't know. You tell me. What, what what's your advice? For our listeners who, one, are going to be choosing sensors, which many of them are, or two, are potentially even making sensors, I would think you're going to want to encrypt it right from the sensor, but what's, what, you know, what's your advice there? Yeah, I've actually thought a bit about this uh, because of your podcast. Um, so basically, what I think needs to happen is there needs to be adjustable standards based on a risk tolerance and uh, mm-hmm. capabilities of the device. And this needs to be a quick framework that someone can simply employ. So they say, what is the data that this sensor will be interacting with? Is it on 
low, medium, or high priority. Um, well, mm -hmm. it's high priority. Okay, now next um, decision tree, what is the hardware that's, um, on, uh, that's on the system? Can it support mm -hmm. A, B, or C types of security? And mm -hmm. you simply have a business rule that says um, something like, if um, mutually authenticated encryption is not possible at a algorithm strength of this or above, mm -hmm. then fail. And so you simply do a two question or three question little interface or interview or whatever for the sensor. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. it simply comes down to it, look, it's sensitive data, but it actually cannot support creating an algorithm or having a security exchange or interaction of sufficient strength then you have to say you fail the the business requirement of security for that particular endpoint. Great advice. Great advice. Yeah. So you're saying build build these business rules, and I love that. You know, in the sense of what because not all not all data. Who cares? You know, it, and I can come up. You know, I, I have a couple clients that I'm working with, and one in particular. Yeah, sure. You capture that data. Go ahead, have it. You know, it, it's not an issue. But there are some that do matter. So you're saying. Make that as part of your buying criteria. Is but first of all, think about this, right? No, absolutely, and yeah, and I've heard some of the previous conversations. It, it was interesting stuff. So, I mean, let's say you have something that's um, <laughs> sump pump keeps coming up. Uh, oh yeah, I keep Lovely hearing sump this. Pump. Yep. Absolutely, yep. but let's say that's reporting, and there could conceivably be some sort of security information around that. So, I wouldn't say that there's never any, but let's assume there is none. Mm. Um, it's a simple business decision, right? This is a, another way security gets a bad name is to say, you know, encrypt all the things. Well, if it's some pump information in an extremely mm. distant, right. low value area, maybe yeah. it doesn't require any encryption at all. And maybe the next Absolutely. level above it is a very low level encryption that mm -hmm. is just best effort, but still above clear text. So, that entire range could apply based on the business requirements. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, the other interesting part is data versus metadata. And I suppose, I guess it depends on the protocols that you're using to pull that sensor data. But is there is there any logic in encrypting or securing metadata and not the actual data itself? I would say that... Um, from the attacker perspective, that's mm -hmm. all data. It's, it's okay. when, when I'm looking at content, when I'm looking at a protocol, uh, when I'm looking at how to attack something, the difference between data about data and data are, you know, negligible. R really, it all comes down to how can I use this to attack the system? So what do you mean though? I guess the value of the, you're separating the value of the data from ability to attack the data or, or clarify that for me no i was just saying that as an attacker i wouldn't see much difference between data and metadata okay uh, in okay. terms of one being encrypted or not because uh, the other phenomenon here is lots of small things some, sometimes turn into very major things so mm -hmm. maybe maybe sump pump data from this remote texas location um, is worthless, but maybe if I'm getting 14 million of them mm -hmm. live in real time, now maybe I have some sort of data that I can hinge an attack on. Yep, yep. No, that makes sense. All right, number two, encrypted connections, unencrypted connections. What what, what do you see as your number three? Um, so I think weak update systems are going to be huge. I, I think I would think so. Yeah, right? yeah. This is a really, really big deal. Um, so our first, actually, pretty much all, all three studies that we did uh, touched on this pretty seriously. And we have it in the um, OWASP project as well. But mm -hmm. some of the things we're seeing, we're seeing um, the downloads of the updates over FTP. This is extremely common, which is a clear text protocol. So the username and password is sent in the clear. Oh, geez. Um, okay. The destination server that hosts the software um, we've had a couple of instances where it was world writable. So you can actually write the software. <laughs> um, even more disturbing, uh, we're seeing that the software that you could write there, it's not, say this vendor 
um, whatever the name of the vendor is, it has all, um, it sells, let's say, 2,000 products. And of course, we're only testing one, but the entire software hosting platform was writable. Jeez. And then the other thing you have to consider is, is the software that's downloaded, is it signed? And we're, that's another aspect that we have of the testing methodology. And oftentimes the software is not signed. So you can just, you know, uh, modify it in whatever way, repackage it, name it the same, and the, the device will go and eat it thinking it's legitimate. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. Okay. You combine all of these together and you have a severely broken update system. Yeah, and I'd even I'd even, you know, sort of go back one level and uh, is everybody is everybody incorporating update systems at all? I mean, it, I would assume this would be a best practice, right? No, but, that's you know phenomenal point. I mean, that's step zero, and, and unfortunately, yeah, yeah. Even even what we talked about is better than um, not having one. And I think as IoT rolls out, um it's just going to become more and more important. And, and I think this is getting adequate coverage from lots of different people. So I, hopefully people are catching on. We do have it in the OWASP project. We talk about it internally at HP. Um, but yeah, just absolutely crucial that people get this right. I mean, you just don't want to put anything out there that's designed to be infrastructure that cannot be updated. And, you know, not all update systems are the same. Right. I mean, you have, sure. uh, for example, I mean, the one option, one extreme would be in three weeks, we'll send you a USB key, uh, <laughs> remove subsection um, 4A from the back of the device, um, tap into the circuit board, uh, enter in the USB key, run through this installer. So what percentage of people are going to do that? Very, very tiny. Versus right. some other car companies, upon hearing that they had a vulnerability, they pushed an update over the air. They came out and uh, said, hey, you know, bad on us. We updated it. We got it fixed. Um, one project I do want to mention is uh, called uh, I Am the Cavalry. I'm not sure if you've heard of that one. No, no, I haven't. Yeah, it's no. interesting. It's, um, it's basically oriented around uh, public safety and... Uh, making sure that uh, car companies and other, other types of uh, companies like that are um, doing the right thing in terms of um, updates and a number of diff different factors. It's run by um, a friend of mine named Josh Corman. And, mm. uh, they have, we'll link to that. Yeah, they have a five-star system. It, it's really interesting. Well, you know, I'm just, I'm just playing off of, you know, in IT anyway, you know, network security, but... I just pulled up something here as part of my as part of my class that I give on on security best practices. Well, that's not on that, but that's just part of the IoT class. But it's like ninety nine point nine percent of exploited common vulnerabilities and exposures, what they call CVE, CVEs, are known for a year before the compromise. Now, to me, you know that says it all. It says if you have <laughs> if you have an update system that's working and then we'll get into, you know, how good it is as you were, as you were mentioning, it's only going to be 0.1%, 0.1% of the, of the vulnerabilities are going to be there as long as you can, you know, these are known. Uh, the cat and mouse game is being played and the cat, the cat eventually figures it out. And so uh, does that ring true with you? I mean, that, that stat, I think it comes from, yeah, from uh, the FTC, you know, government site, but 99.9%. .9%, so what that says, if you look at the other way is point. 0.1%, you know, of, of exploits can be, can be mitigated if you just update the software, update the security software system. Yeah. And I think there's some nuance there. I think what they're mm. talking about is the fact that for the compromises that they knew about. Yes. Good point. Right. For the good compromises yeah. that they knew about, um, they all basically all could have been prevented by patching. Um, which is a whole larger security discussion basically around, you know, a lot of companies have existing vulnerabilities and they have lots and lots of them and they really mm. help with uh, fixing them. All right, Daniel, this is, uh, this, is, this is going very well and I think we have a lot more to go through. Are you available to, uh, to stay around for part two? Yeah, absolutely. 
All right. So um, we'll be putting part two in a separate podcast and we'll uh, talk to you then. Okay. Okay. That was a good talk with Daniel Meisler. This podcast goes vertical, deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. Or, if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent, on Twitter. And of course, you can support this show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. It's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is, again, with Daniel Meisler, How to Tame IoT's Frankenstein-like Security Monster Part 2. I hope you can join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Till next week, may your path to IoT business be a secure one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 